But if you ever go with me, you will not starve. I can order food like a champ. You won't get lost. Um, sometimes I get the joke, but yeah. So I'm so happy to talk with y'all today and to share about what God has allowed me to do in Tanzania. It has really, really been a joy and a privilege um, to get to be there over the, the past uh, several years. Um, and I really just want to honor the Lord in sharing this today. So I'm going to start by a word of prayer, if that's okay. Lord, thank you so much for your kindness to us and for your love um, to us and the way you allow us to participate in your work in the world. You don't have to, but you do, and it's a privilege. Um, and I just pray that today when I share some of my story, um, that I will honor you in that, Lord, and that you will be exalted and, and not me. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Okay, so yeah, the Reds, Tanzania. Um, you can't probably see it from where you're sitting, but there's a little dot of an island in Lake Victoria, and that's Sukarewe, and that's what I'm going to tell you all about today, that place. So just a little outline. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got to Tanzania, and that really started in my childhood and the way that my parents raised me um, to love missions. I'm so grateful for that. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about how I actually got there, some lessons I've learned about, uh, along the way, and I'm going to tell you about Tumaini Jipia, which means new hope. More on that coming in a, in a little bit. Um, so in God's kindness, I was born to Christian parents who loved the Lord. Um, they became believers in late high school and college, and so they were very zealous to live their lives pursuing a relationship with, with Christ. And my home church was just a small church where people were very serious about living pious lives, knowing scripture, and global missions. Those were probably the things I would say they're known for. Um, and I look back on my childhood just very grateful for, for parents and a church that loved me so well and really instilled a love for God's word um, in, in my heart as even a young age. The overall trajectory of their lives was and is still to be uh, to be found faithful. And for that, I really do praise God. So I became a believer at a young age, um, and I can't really remember a time where I didn't know the gospel. They had taught, taught me it since I was born. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but I have at times struggled with assurance of my salvation. I struggle with doubts. Um, but because of some of the hard things I went through as a child, um, I've learned obedience during the, the doubts. And some of that has been because of the way my parents have modeled those things um, to me. And God is continuing to use those doubts and the dry seasons to equip me for the work that, that he has for me to do. But it wasn't until um, college that I started to hear about God's heart for justice. So that my, my parents and their church, they were very concerned about global missions. But the idea of God uh, loving justice and wanting us to be a part of his work, pursuing justice in the world, wasn't a truth that I even saw in scripture until I was in college. And um, so I did this national exchange, not international, but national. I went to Fresno State for a semester, um, but lived with a family that was doing inner city ministry, and it was very transformative for me. And during that time, um, I studied Amos, Micah, and other minor prophets that talked about God's heart for justice and how he wanted his people to be involved in that work. And so I was really, um, it was a really transformative time for me, and it compelled me to want to figure out how I could be a part of that in the world um, today. So I finally went on a, actually went on my first mission trip in um, I guess it was 2020, wait, 2002 maybe, um, to Mexico, so this is clearly not Mexico, um, and was able to do that a, 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 several times with my church um, in college, but I went to Tanzania for the first time on actually a service learning trip. So if you ever have the opportunity to do study abroad or service learning as a student, I would tell you, do it. It can be transformative. Um, so I thought this was going to be just a one-time thing with the Uni University of Georgia, um, but I, I was at the same time starting my PhD and found out before I even 
came back from this first trip that I was going to be funded to go back in, in 2009. So I was like, okay, this is great. Like I'm starting to form these relationships. I spent about three weeks there um, and was just thrilled that I would get, knew that I would get to go back. And that kind of thing kept happening uh, like over and over. I kept getting somehow funding to go back. And so um, I, I developed these really good relationships with women in the community, was able to work um, with adolescent girls on just some of the issues that they were facing. Um, met uh, In 2009, another friend started going with me and went with me a couple of times um, too. Her name is Hunter, and she was a drama person, so we were able to use drama and creativity and writing and different things like that to work with these girls um, and learn about some of the challenges that they were facing in just li living as a girl in Tanzania. And there are a lot of huge challenges. Um, so girls would share bits and pieces of their stories with us. Some of their stories were about just issues of living in poverty or lack of education. Um, but you know, sometimes they would share things that they loved about their families or about living on in, in, in Lake Victoria. But sometimes we were hearing stories about early pregnancy, forced withdrawal from school, pressure from older men to have sex with them. And these stories were, they just, they struck me. And I felt very burdened by, um, by those, those things. So I ultimately ended up going back in 2012 um, for about six months to live in this community and um, work with the local uh, women and, that I had formed this relationship with um, and was able to do some community groups with girls where they were able to participate, tell me more about their, the challenges that they faced. Um, and um, so ultimately, the, the research was on gender discrimination of, of school girls. Um, so just to pause a minute so, you, so that you can see where Ukurewe is, it is here, in this orange, in Lake Victoria. It's about a three-hour ferry ride from Mwanza, which is down here. Mwanza is the second largest city in uh, Tanzania and fast-growing fast as well. Um, so it's pretty remote. You know, by the time you take the two, trip, two long flights from, um, from here, uh, or from Atlanta, uh, then you have to take an in-country flight to Mwanza, and then you hop on this three-hour boat ride. Um, so yeah, it, it takes a while to get there. Um, and and it, because they are kind of isolated from the, the mainland, I think that's another reason some, that they face some of the issues that they face. Um, just some more context. It's a pretty young population. About two-thirds are under the age of 25. Um, they have a pretty high fertility rate. Um, poverty has actually gotten a, a good bit better, but it still has a long way to go. Okay, um, malaria is the leading cause of death of, in children, so that is, is pretty scary. Um, they, there is a malaria vaccine that just got approved. Praise the Lord, isn't that awesome? But it hasn't quite been rolled out everywhere yet. Um, so that, that'll be helpful in the future. Um, I, I wanted to point out that HIV is still a real high cause of death, or it's the leading cause of death in adults, um, which you know is an issue if young girls are being forced into early sex. Um, that's a pretty staggering number, three, thir 32,000 deaths um, in 2020 because of HIV. Um, okay, so I continued going back to Tanzania. I did my dissertation research there. Then I came home and um, wrote everything up and was just like, what now, God? Like, I have all this data. I have this 280-something page dissertation that's going to sit on a shelf. What do I do with this thing? Um, and I, I spent probably a year um, crying and praying and asking the Lord what to do. Um, you know, and I mentioned already that as a Christian, I'm, I'm really strongly convicted to seek justice in the world because of my faith, on behalf of the oppressed. And, but as a social worker, also, my master's is in social work, um, I am trained to recognize issues of injustice and to do something about it, and that's part of my calling, and I just love how they can be combined together um, to do that. Um, so 
I wasn't sure what to do, because um, these are the research findings, and they're pretty heavy. Um, women and girls have historically not been valued in a Karewe culture. So I'll, I'll tell you like a proverb that I, I heard <laughs> multiple times. I heard, it, I heard it the first time, and I thought, what a strange thing to say. And then I kept hearing it. So it was a thing that was said in the culture, but it's to educate a girl is like watering your neighbor's garden. You're not going to get the benefit of it. So, and that's really what people would say. Um, so women and girls have historically not been valued in, in Nukurwewe culture. So I've, I've heard other stories, like if a girl was sitting on a stool and her young brother uh, you know, walked into the room and asked for the stool, she would have to get off the stool and give it to her young brother because he was more valuable than she was. Um, number two, girls are taken advantage of um, by men through transactional sex. So I, I distinguish this from prostitution. So, you know, prostitution, uh, usually it's your, your Sometimes there may be a pimp or somebody like that involved, um, but you are trading yourself, your body for money. In transactional sex, you're using your body as a, like the currency. So you need a basic thing like soap or breakfast or school fees. You might use your body to get those things. Those were the examples. Those literally were some of the things that I was told that they were have needing and you use transactional sex to get. Um, number three, teachers often exploit their girls' students. So in a place that's supposed to be safe, girls could actually be taken advantage of in their schools. Um, and this is connected to number four, which is no justice. There's a lack of justice for those that are the, pow the, the most without power. The, the, um, so the, that would be girls and the poor. The, gir the girls in Ukarewe are kind of what? Both things are true for them, right? They're girls and they're poor. Um, so they, are, uh, they really struggle to get access to, to true justice. Um, if they were to go to the police, the police would say, OK, well, give me some money so that I can go investigate this. I don't have any transportation fee or transportation money, so give me some money so that I can get myself there. Um, so and then also if there was, you know, if somebody was to actually do an investigation, which doesn't happen very often, um, the perpetrator could just buy off the police or the court or whoever. Um, and then number five, deterioration of culture. This one seems kind of ironic. Um, to me, in light of number one, right? Um, but this was more in terms of the way women cared for other girls, like girls in the community. So um, the, the older women would say, like, we, you know, people used to sit under the mango tree, you know, with the girls and tell them, this is how you, you know, are going to develop, and this is, these are the th things you can expect in your life, or whatever. Um, really kind of teaching about teaching them about their bodies, about womanhood, things like that, but that um, they weren't really doing that anymore. They also talked about how communities used to do more communal parenting, but they don't, they kind of stay out of their, uh, like mind their own business now. There's less of the communal parenting going on. Um, so these were some of the solutions that came out of, um, you know, the things that were suggested from the inter interviews that I had with women and um, with these participant observation groups that I did with these girls. Um, and so, and also the research does support some of this as well. So education for girls, if you can keep a girl safe at school and in school, and she can complete her secondary education, she will delay pregnancy, she um, will not be getting married early, so you're, you're delaying these risks to her body, um, you will increase her wage earning, um, it decreases hunger and malnutrition because she's going to have fewer babies. If she starts younger, she's going to have more babies, right, because she's going to be pregnant more frequently. And um, then it reduces 
has the, the impact of reducing maternal and mortality rates. So that is a key uh, thing that can actually make a huge difference in the lives of girls. Um, but the girls also suggested like government intervention. They kept saying things like, we want the government to protect us. We wish they would help us. Um, that, that is a little more complicated. You need somebody like International Justice Mission to come in and do that kind of thing. But, um, but th yeah, that's a little bit more complicated. Girls value, uh, parents valuing girls more was another thing that the girls said. Um, but one of the things that was really on my heart and that I heard several times from the women and in the moment that I heard it when I was living there in 2012, um, I dismissed it. So women said, we need a boarding school for girls. And I just kept thinking like, that is impossible. Like who's gonna, like there's no money on this island. Like how are we gonna pay for a boarding school? Um, and that, that was the thing that when I was praying over that year after, and writing my dissertation, dissertation, that was the thing that kept coming back to me. Like, I don't know how this is going to be possible, but I feel like maybe this boarding school is going to be a solution. Um, so in 2014, um, my friend Hunter that I mentioned earlier came back with me. And we went back to Ukraine. We went, we went to um, recruit local leadership that I already knew from the time that my husband and I were living there, um, and particularly leadership from Africa Inland Church. And uh, we had gone to a church that from Africa, uh, it was an African Inland Church that we went to um, regularly when we were living there. And I just loved their mission and their vision. I thought it was incredible. I saw the good work that they were already doing, and I trusted them. And um, so we went and met with these local leaders, some of them the church, and some of them just local teachers or local uh, leaders in the community, and um, asked, you know, what do you think about trying to do a boarding school? And everybody was like, yes, we want to do a boarding school. Like, we've been wanting to do it for years. Um, and so it just felt like way out there, but somehow that was happening. So that was 2014. Um, I, I love that it was their idea and not my idea and, because I can't take credit for it. It was totally their vision um, and desire to see that happening. So they recognized this need for change. They came up with this potential solution. Um, and even the, the bishop, the archbishop was here yesterday. Some of y'all met him, but um, he was visiting from Tanzania. And he said boarding schools are, they're, they're actually very effective. They seem crazy to us as Americans, but they're very effective in Tanzania. Um, so they were willing to partner with us to provide the on the ground um, legwork and um, oversight and all of those things. And then ultimately, you know, the gospel is the one that that's what's going to transform this community. But if girls, if this boarding school, you know, girls can go to school, they can hear the gospel, they can be empowered by getting an education, they can stay in school, they can do all these other things. Then they can go back to their communities with a skill and knowledge of the truth. Then they actually can like be, be part of transforming their community. Okay, so fast forward to um, so this was 2014. Lots of stuff happened between four, 2014 and 2023. But fast forward to 2023, and um, I am on sabbatical, and it was awesome. My goals for my sabbatical were to do some more research in this, in this area, the lake zone, um, wanting to uh, fur like further develop ways that communities, but in, per particular, in particular the church, could be uh, part of um, coming up with local solutions. Because the reality is, local solutions to, to preventing early pregnancy and girls, young girls getting pregnant, right? Because the reality is that all girls are not going to be able to go to a boarding school. It's just not going to happen. Um, some of them won't, won't have the grades. Some of them, um, their parents maybe won't let them, whatever. Um, there, there's a host of reasons why it's not going to work for everybody. And there's a lot of girls that would like to not get pregnant at 14. Um, so what can the community do to come alongside and protect these girls? And uh, you know, can it be that they come up with programs at their church or, or maybe women in the community are trained and equipped to be like the safe women? 
So that was the goal of my, my sabbatical, um, number one. And that was very complicated because um, doing research in, in Tanzania has gotten a lot more complicated than when I did it in 2012. Um, and I won't get into all the politics of it, but suffice it to say, you have to jump through a lot of hoops. It's like you go, you get one approval and then you go, go to another office and get another approval, and then you get another approval and all the way down. Um, and all of the approvals then have to be get, that issued like in paper. And then you take that paper to the next office and it, Greg's <laughs> laughing, my husband, because it was just kind of a disaster. So. About midway through my sabbatical, I realized that the research was probably not going to pan out, um, although I did try until like the very end to make that happen. Um, and I won't tell you all a whole lot about what I'm doing instead, but I, there is like existing quantitative data that I'm, I'm collaborating with um, Sarah McCarty in, in economics to um, examine that and look at that. But, what I wanted to do was get the qualitative stuff because hearing people's stories and their experiences, you could a lot of times get deeper, richer um, data. Um, but that will hopefully hopefully happen in the future. But then the other point of my sabbatical in this, I didn't know was going to actually pan out until like December 20, 2022, right before we left, um, and it was to be a part of opening this new school. And um, so in 2022, December, everything just like came together. We've been working on building this school. Uh, I think the building started in 2015. And we've been working you know, for years to, to get everything built. And it was like enough funds were, were suddenly in the bank account. And then um, the, the government like approved everything kind of at the last second. And we were able to hire people, and all of these things happened. And then um, we found students that wanted to come. And so all of this happened. We knew that we were going to be able to open, and we were leaving like January. I think we left January 1st or 2nd to go. So um, so we got my, my family. Greg is here, my husband, and our two little girls got to be there for the grand opening. And, and I even got to be part of hiring some of the teachers and recruiting some of the students, making home visits and go, like actually spending time with them and getting to know them. So we didn't know that we were going to get to be so embedded in the school itself and really until we got there because I kept thinking my research was going to be approved and then it kept not getting approved. Um, so again, I, I'll tell you a little more about the school. So our vision um, is we desire to bring opportunity and redemption to the lives of girls in Ukurewe District of Tanzania. That's kind of broad, but that's the goal. And the mission is that um, every that every pupil has the opportunity to re receive a high quality education free of abuse and injustice in a Christ honoring atmosphere. And so um, that's Kazilankanda in red. And that's where the school is. We wanted a place that was in the middle of the island so it would be easier for most of the villages on the island to ex um, be able to, to access it. And um, it also um, has a pretty good water source. And it, they were, there was electricity in that village, too. A lot, some of the villages still don't have electricity. Um, and so, um, and then the church had a lot of extra land just empty land. That's, that was on one of my earlier slides. I didn't tell you all that that was the land, but um, they were wanting to give it to the school. So we were really grateful about that. Um, to my knee, GPA means new hope, um, and that's what we want to offer at this school for these girls. Um, all, the, all secondary school girls are invited and welcome to attend. Um, we, we don't discriminate based on religion or tribe or anything like that. And um, so, and it's been just a, a joy to get to know, to, to know each of them. So um, what compels me to do this work? And I, and I say what compels me to do this work in light of the work of the school, but also in the research itself, right? So um, I, you know, it's been hard and discouraging over, over the years uh, because there just have, have it's like there's been so many roadblocks, but then at times it's like other doors just fling open, so I never know what to expect. Um, but I, I do believe that as, as Christians, we have been called to seek justice on behalf of the oppressed. Um, 
we're not going to do that in lieu of preaching the gospel, right? They should come together. Um, but I think if we're not obedient to the things that, that Christ has called us to do, and you know, and that includes seeking justice, that the world will question our legitimacy and maybe even call us hypocrites. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, cared for the whole person, right? He healed people. He restored people's dignity, and he gave them the truth. And so we can do all of those things together, too. So this school is an inroad for the gospel to be given to all the girls that attend, um, but they're also going to be cared for. They are being cared for. They're being treated with dignity. They're being loved. They're being protected. Um, and they're having the opportunity to become the people that, that the Lord created them to be. Okay, here's my family, and I want to there. This is us in Tanzania. Um, <laughs> I wanted to share some lessons and um, joys along the way. So um, for my family, you know, it was a big deal to, to like th take them out of the school and homeschool them and all of this for sabbatical. They, the girls had both actually been to Tanzania before as babies, but they didn't remember. They were little. Um, and the oldest one... I think one of the things she really learned while we were there was to be brave. So she's, you know, she can be very anxious. And even while she was there, we, you know, while we were there, she had some moments of, like, being very anxious. But as she's come home, it's just been incredible to see the, like, brave things she's doing now. My husband and I, Greg and I, were, are just like, we never would have imagined that she would do some of these things. That, And we think that it was that transformative, you know, that time where, she was exposed to a different culture. She was out of her comfort zone. And now she's like, I can do hard things. And it's, it's great. It's been really, really cool. But my girls also got to learn more about uh, loving people that are different from them in this short amount of time. Um, and they still pray for the girls at the school regularly on their own. I, I don't have to prompt them. Um, and... Yeah, the little one, you can see she's, like, living, living it up. She loved it. <laughs> um, but some of the things that I've learned for myself have been um, to just to be moldable, to have a more of a learning stance, to not come in, like, expecting that I'm going to know things, um, or and especially, you know, that I'm going to teach them something, because a lot of times they're teaching me. Um, you know, and those are things that I've learned just along the way and, and, and working cross-culturally, collaborating closely with people. Um, but through collaborating with Africa Inland Church and um, the local community leaders, I really have been able to see more of who Jesus is. And that's been a gift. I've gained more of an understanding of the faithfulness of God, the way these people serve each other, out of their poverty, the way they give to each other, the way they welcome. I mean, every time I'm there, I just feel so loved and cared for and welcomed. Um, and then he continues to provide through, uh, through favor, through funds, through the right people to come along. Um, and it's just been, it's been amazing. But also by the way that the Lord has raised up these leaders in Ukarewe, this is, you know, a place that, that desperately needs the Lord. He has shown his very great love for these people by allowing me to be their friend and their colleague and their coworker alongside them. He has shown his very great love for me as well. Um, so through all these things, the Lord has given me a hope for his kingdom that is coming and is to come, uh, and it's been a joy. So I want to show you a couple of pictures from the school and tell you about some of the girls. This friend here in the blue shirt, his name was Warioba, and um, Greg and I actually met him in 2012 when we were living in Ukarewe, and he was an intern at Africa Inland Church at the time. And um, he just loves the Lord so well. Um, he has no shame, and I love just, just spending time with him because especially praying with him, um, he just pours his whole, all of his energy and all of his heart out before the Lord, and it's just really, really beautiful. It's really cool. Um, so I'm going to tell you about one of the girls that um, is a student at our school, and um, this is a pseudonym for her name, so I'll call her Glory. 
Um, so we visited her home, me and Warioba, and actually one of my students that was there with me on part of the sabbatical. Um, and w one of her, uh, Glory, um, one of her primary teachers. So he is like on our, our um, group that's helping to recruit uh, te uh, students. So we went to her home to do a home visit. And um, so imagine you're walking down a path like it's kind of um, farmlandish with some trees and maybe a cow over here. You walk down and there, her home is kind of like a, like uh, just different rooms but not, there's not like an entrance to the house, okay? So the rooms are kind of around and there's like a little entryway, but it's not like a door, it's like a little gate. So you're walking into kind of like a, uh, a, a courtyard, you could say that, and that's supposed to be like her, her house. But the, um, the, the different rooms had, I don't even know if, I can't remember if they had doors on the rooms, but all, if they did, they were all open and you could see inside that they didn't really have anything in, this, in their house. Um, they had some mattresses, I mean, some, some bed frames, but not mattresses, which was kind of interesting to me. I think I would want the other way around, <laughs> like right, a mattress and not the bed frame. Um, and her dad um, has, so her mom died when she was really young and he remarried. Her dad either has a mental illness, like significant mental illness, or he is being plagued by demons or something like that um, because he will take off all his clothes and just like run around. He will um, beat random people like the neighbors have to tie him down at times to protect him from himself and um, from other people. And so when we went to do this home visit to see if she was interested in coming to school because she did pretty well in primary school and this was gonna be the end of her schooling unless she went to a secondary school like on scholarship. Um, and because secondary school is not always free in Tanzania, especially if it's gonna be a good school. Um, so we went because we wanted to recruit her and, and we thought she would do well in school. And so she wasn't actually there. We came into this you know, home where we saw all these things and we met um, him and he was kind of on a like little rampage, and then we met the stepmom who was there, and then Glory wasn't actually there, um, but we told them about the school, and the stepmom said, you know, we'll we'll bring her, we, she can come to school. Um, but um, she didn't really have a plan to get her there because they don't have a, any, they don't have a vehicle, um, so the, and even like a motorcycle, motorcycle is like a normal way of transportation. So the teacher that went with us, the primary school teacher, went and picked her up on his motorcycle and brought her to school. I can't imagine, like, I would, it would be kind of a big deal to me, you know, going to a secondary school, uh, you know, away from my family and where I'm gonna live and not have my parents drop me off. But this teacher comes and drops her off, signs her in, um, and she doesn't have any of the things she's supposed to have um, at all, and she just cries. It's just, it's just, my heart is like broken for her. She cries because like she's ashamed. She doesn't have anything. She's embarrassed. She's probably nervous. Um, but y'all, she is thriving at school. And it is so, so cool. She's become a sweet friend. Um, she's loved by her peers. And the teachers love her. Um, but the first time they had like a longer break where the girls would go home for break, um, she was the only one that had to stay at school. And it was so sad, because she kind of wanted to go home, but the parents had gone to another island to visit a witch doctor who maybe helped dad. Um, so those are some of the you know challenges that, that so many of these girls are facing. I'd say hers is probably one, one of the more extreme um, stories. But it was interesting because I felt so bad that she couldn't go home, like she really, kind of wanted to see her siblings, you know, wanted to go home. But then I thought later, like, her dad is struggling in so many ways and has potentially been abusive. Maybe this was God's way of protecting her. She had to stay at the school with the headmistress. And, the head, and now she has also, like, a really sweet way or a sweet relationship with this headmistress as well. 
Um, so it's just been cool to see the way the Lord has brought uh, these different students to here, um, to, to Tumaini GPF. Another pair of um, sisters, so that we recruited both of them to come to the school. Um, they have the same dad, different moms. They're about the same age. They live with grandma, and they haven't seen any of their parents. In, they, they don't know where they are. They haven't seen them in years. Um, so we were also recruited them, and they are doing well. Um, but that's like a kind of a typical family type situation. Kids have been kind of pushed off on grandma. Um, parents are somewhere, but nobody knows where. And so this is just a great opportunity for them to have some stability, support, and know that they're loved and cared for. Now we have this issue where, like at first we were like having to go door to door, right, and like recruit. Um, and now parents are like eager to bring their kids to the school. and. Um, th we, so we, we just, the teachers just started this pre-Form 1 program. So it's a, a special program to get the students ready for starting Form 1, which is like the first grade of, of their secondary school. Um, and it's actually a government requirement that, they, that students, or that the school provides a pre-Form 1 program. And so we have like 47 girls that just showed up for this pre-Form 1 program. We're supposed to have 25 in a class. Now we have 47 of them there. Some of them are like from just the very local village and are walking for just the day. Um, but yeah, um, that's gonna be uh, difficult in the, in the spring, I think, to, we'll have to turn some away. I think that's gonna be hard. Um, so we welcomed these Form 1 students in January 2023. We opened this pre-Form 1 program. Um, the Lord has provided money also for just a lot of buildings. We, I feel like that's kind of almost all we did between 2014 and 2023 was build buildings because there are so many requirements from the government about how many science labs you have and how many classrooms you have and do you have enough dorms to expand and all of these types of things. So we have two classrooms, that was our first structure, two more under construction, two dorms, a kitchen and a dining hall, a well, latrines, administrative offices, two science labs, and now we have a chicken house. <laughs> yes. So the chicken house, I'm super excited about this. Um, this was Warioba's idea, our school manager. And it is, the goal is that, uh, so apparently there, eggs are imported to the island. Now, I, that's hard for me to like fathom importing all these eggs to an island, right? It seems like they would ha have a lot of opportunity to be broken on the way. But, um, I mean, people have chickens, but they're not, like, sharing the eggs, I guess. And so the, the eggs that are bought in the, the market are, are imported. So Wario's plan was we get all these chickens, girls will have eggs, girls can have chickens, and then we can sell eggs. So we started with 222 chickens. <laughs> There's 278 coming like next week. And so we're gonna have 500 chickens, um, which seemed, I was like, he wanted to start with a thousand. And I was like, no, like, we're, like, we're gonna get, we're gonna be ending up with a farm of chickens and not like a school and trying to support, like emphasis on the girls, not the chickens. Um, so, but it will be awesome too, because like part of their schooling is actually, it's kind of like home ec. I guess you could say, they do some, they have little small gardens, they're learning how to do some small plots, that's supplementing their nutrition at the school, and they're also going to have like a rotation of helping with the chickens. And so, you know, even if they, f they finish school and they have this degree, they'll, you know, maybe they can't get a job right away, they'll at least have these skills that they know how to grow their own food or raise their own, um, you know, livestock or animals. So next steps are, um, we are in the process of recruiting students for next year. I think they're gonna be mostly recruited out of these 47 that we have in pre-form one. Um, but the, the, the challenge and the complication will be limiting it to the 25 to 28 that we have room for. Dorm-wise, that's all we have room for. Um, so that's gonna be big. Um, Finishing the next classroom block, we were hoping to start a computer lab and getting some computers 
and um, then teacher housing. So the teachers have moved from different parts of the country, and it's very typical that um, that teachers, that the government and government schools, but also private schools, have actual like housing on site for their teachers um, because otherwise it can be really difficult for them to even get there. And they have very high expecta expectations for the um, commitments that the teachers have because they're expected to do study labs in the evening and just different things like that. So we're hoping to do teacher housing next. Um, and then Lord willing, on, on the research side, I will get to go back in January and do a little bit of research, I hope. I made it through, the, I think, the last process of government approval like a month ago. Um, so if you're interested, what could you do? So a specific prayer requests are um, that we would continue to have government favor. Uh, we, it's just been kind of incredible that they um, have been, they've been actually really great on the, the school uh, issue. Um, we have like a point person there uh, on the island who's just been really supportive and really helpful with all of that um, so that we would continue to have favor with the government. Um, pray that we would be able to continue to, de to develop Christ-honoring policies, but particularly around the cost for attendance. Most of the girls are um, sponsored by, like, friends. <laughs> um, and... Um, but some of them are paying and because we we do want some of them to to pay and e even if it's not that they're paying money they may be paying with like a bag of rice or something like that they're bringing something to contribute to the school um but you know also in terms of screening for entrance that that we are uh welcoming girls that um are want to want to be there want to be focused on um, on learning and all of that um, but it's going to be hard to tell people no to at some point we can't take everybody um, and then pray for the hearts of the girls that are attending and just protection for them when they go home because they are still at risk in the community um, that our staff would be faithful um, yeah those would be the major prayer requests and then if you are ever interested in um, coming with me to Tanzania yeah, I do take people um, I love to take students i love to take colleagues there are needs beyond just the ones that i touched on today um far you know far many more than than i mentioned today so i'd be happy to talk to you about coming at some point i think that's all and I'm, i'd be happy to answer any questions that y'all might have if y'all have any thank y'all for coming today A perspective of feeling like if I'm going to do research it needs to matter particularly if like if I'm recruiting participants to be a part of it that it needs to go back and be beneficial for them um, and that, that like their voices need to be heard um, through that so you know I do feel like like a lot of times even the solutions that they come up with I, I feel compelled to honor those solutions and that might not necessarily mean that I'm going to be the one to like implement all of these things but that that the solutions that they came up with are known um, by other people and that people can be a part of of creating that change whatever that change may be does that answer your question a little bit because uh, for social research setting you want to like very acknowledge like like 
maybe you if you're too much involved to what mm -hmm. you're going to do, it will mess up your your sure. results. So the very end goal of research and the very end goal of missionary sometimes they may conflict with each other. Mm. Yeah. I think there are conflicts at times. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, thanks. We can talk more. Any other questions? Hey. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Dr. H, for sharing. Thanks. I wanted to ask about your teachers. Like, are the teachers mainly male or female? And what are their backgrounds? Yeah. Um, and what Great classes question. they teach there? Okay, so um, we have, Wario Bo likes to say we have an even gender parity kind of thing going on. So we, um, we do have a, women, a woman that's the headmistress, and she teaches a little bit. And um, we, it, so about, I'd say it's about half and half in terms of staff um, and also teachers um, for males and females. I, at one point early on, we said we, we only want to hire women because you know if we have this issue of like sex with teachers we don't want it happening here um but then the the bishop who's now deceased um that helped in in the early stages um he said yeah but then the girls are never going to see godly men like you know and so like you got to hire some godly men so they have people to like look up to and he was so wise and so we're really grateful for the men that we also have. Um, but yeah, we have six or seven teachers at this point. And then we have um, two cooks, a matron who lives in the, the dorm with the girls, and she's phenomenal. She's here in the blue, the, the bright blue in the middle with a big smile. Um, she's wonderful. She actually has some a little bit of a social work background. Um, and she yeah and then yeah actually this is most of this are part of the staff um we have three security guards and um two cooks and i think that's it for staff am i missing anything greg no she was her her daughter was but yeah that's most of the staff we're missing a few of them but they're just so wonderful. I'm like, I got to, you know, observe in their classrooms w because we were there. And um, this one in the light blue on the end was teaching a civics lecture. And um, I can't remember the, all of the details of, of it, the lecture at all, but it was about like your value and worth. And she was using the, the um, curriculum like from the government and then she she kind of goes off script and she was like you know but here at this school we believe you're valuable because god made you in his image and you're important and special because of those things and like it, i just wanted to cry like i was tearing up because this this was like dream come true true like in that moment you know that's what i've been wanting for all of these years for the girls to know that they were valuable and that god made them in his image and here she was telling them that, and they're like, yes. And it was just awesome. Hey, Jane. Quick question. Um, do you guys actually go out and hire the teachers and pay them, or is there any government assistance? In There's that? no government assistance. Um, so I have, I collaborate to, have collaborated to do some of the hiring, but Africa Inland Church is big time involved. Um, so they did a lot of the screening and like they were the ones that were collecting the applications and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but in terms of funding, it, it's, I would say 92% coming from here. So I'm, I'm on the side doing some fundraising, <laughs> which, which is like not my skill set at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so even the teachers, they're all believers, but they're not all from the same church. Um, so 
but we're not like when you say how is that balance struck like I mean <coughs> we're giving everybody the same lessons we're not oh yeah right we do expect the teachers to believe the same things but we don't necessarily expect our, all of our students to be believers there's um, a pretty large Muslim population it's actually growing um, on the island in the time that we were there from January to May uh, there, I mean there there are already more mosques than there were in 2012 but um, there was like another one just down from where we usually say that was built in like I don't know four weeks or something like that quickly this giant mosque um, so the um, Muslim faith is growing but then there's also like just traditional faith or faiths or beliefs with witch doctors and you know things like that that's pretty it's actually pretty common and especially the more rural that you get the more common that is thanks thanks David All right. thank you so much for joining us thank you. appreciate it All right.